this week. Until it happens. Okay, so we will be in Job for a couple weeks. Um, we're not going to go verse by verse. We're going to look more broadly at it. Um, so we won't be stuck in Job for like 70 years. Or something. Okay, good. <laughs> um, oh, just I can't a couple wait weeks. for the dialogue chapters. <laughs> <laughs> Please. Um, we're actually doing the dialogue in three weeks. Wow. All of it. The, there's three rounds. Um, I'm sorry, the dialogue with the friends in three weeks. There, he has three friends, and they each take a round three times. Uh -huh. So each t each one of those rounds ends his responses we'll look at in a single week. So then, plus this one, that's four. Then there's the, the, the other guy who responds, that's five. And then there's responses with God, six. We'll only be here for six weeks okay. in Job. Okay? So... You can tell we're really just going to look broadly at it. Okay. Um, if you want to kind of get the con get the context of what we're looking at, I encourage you to read Job through on your own time because, like I say, we're not going verse by verse. Which will mean, by the way, guys, that we will be in Job less than we're in Philippians. Yeah. And Philippians had four chapters, and Job has like 42 <laughs> or 43 or something. Is it like the second longest book in the Bible? Uh, I don't mm, Do it. Well, because like Isaiah and stuff. 66. Jeremiah is the longest uh, book in the Bible by words. Um, but, but then I think Isaiah is long, Psalms. longest by... Psalms is longest by chapters, but then I think Isaiah is... No, Ezekiel's next to Jeremiah. I forget which. But Jeremiah is the longest by words, so I don't know. Hmm. But Job is long. <laughs> Job is long. Yes, it is. Um, okay, so just a few, a, a few introductory things. Um, the first thing is that we really don't know who wrote it. It doesn't say. You know, like from Philippians where it says, I, Paul, write to you. Well, yeah, we don't have that in Job. And we really don't have a very reliable tradition. So, Go ahead. Uh, so some people say like Moses wrote it or something. Like that. Yeah, there's a lot of different theories, but the problem is we don't really have anything um, reliable. Yeah. Yeah. And so because of that, we really can't do too well on dating it. Which is another another problem. It's probably set sometime around a Abraham or later, but that still doesn't really narrow it down too much. Um, it has been um, assumed that maybe it was written by Isaiah or one of the prophets, which if so, that would be somewhere around like the 900s to 700s BC. But once again, it doesn't say, and there's no reliable tradition, so kind of stuck there. Um, another question that people often raise is, was Job a real person? And the answer really is that it really doesn't matter whether he was real or not, because the the theme of the book is true either way. I'm pretty yeah. sure he's about 90, and like 90% he's real. Sure. Yeah. Um, it, it depends the commentaries that you read. Some people will say, oh no, he definitely wasn't real. And some people will say, I'm not even going to try to argue the point of that t tonight. Um, I've, I've already picked my fights with the Exodus, <laughs> and... Uh, Believing that it was an actual historical event, so I'm not gonna pick. I'm not gonna. I'm gonna skip this battle. Let you guys draw your own conclusions for that one. Um, but um, one thing that's extremely important uh, with Job, uh, especially, is that it's a book of extremes. Right. You know, Job isn't just a pretty good guy. He's said to be, you know, the the best guy in the whole land. You know, and it wasn't just like you know a few bad things happened. I mean, everything went bad, and then he was attacked by Satan himself. You know, it, it's like. It's like the most extreme situation you can possibly imagine. And the reason why Job is so extreme on things is because the main theme is why do the righteous suffer? So what better to use than an extremely righteous person? And instead of just, oh, something bad happened, the worst thing you can possibly imagine by Satan himself happened. Well, that kind of sets it up a little bit more to show the contrast. Now, um, okay, so then... Uh, Part of what's called the books of wisdom, which traditionally answer things about life. Job answers why do the righteous suffer. Ecclesiastes answers what's the reason, what's the purpose of life. Proverbs answers what is wisdom and how should I live. Um, let's see, I think there's one more book of wisdom. Job's, Proverbs, no, I think that's it. Anyways, um, and so then uh, it says that this happens happen in the land of us. Now. Uh, <laughs> like buzz. Uh, it, we don't really have a specific area for this place, but it is somewhere in the area of Edom. Um, we know that Uz was a person in the, listed in the genealogies of Genesis, and it might be safe to say that this is where he settled, and it was called the land of Uz because that's where he lived. Um, but either way, um, it's referenced to be somewhere near Edom. 
or with, either within Edom or outside, just outside the border of Edom. So if you don't know where that is, here's Israel. Here's like the, here's like the Mediterranean. Here's Israel, and in the southeast corner of Israel, uh, and there's a mountain range there, um, and that's uh, Edom there. So, anyways, so a few a few first things that are extremely important to understand when you're going into the Book of Job. Really important things that 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 will are kind of important for understanding the book as a whole. First off, Job assumes that God is sovereign, always. It it it, it, it just starts with the assumption that there is no situation where God is not sovereign, and that's important to emphasize because in a modern culture, um, it's it's somewhat believed that God is like you know sovereign over some things, but then there's some things like he doesn't necessarily care about, or some things that he's just not really he can't really do anything about or whatever. Um, Obviously, that's more in secular circles, but it has kind of seeped into the church. So to really understand Job as a book, you have to understand that it takes the position that God is always sovereign over everything. Um, so then, even when he allows bad situations to bad rulers, which would mean, by extension, that um, when, for instance, Hitler came to power, that God was not – that that didn't accidentally happen. God allowed it to happen. So then the question more becomes, why would he do that, rather than, did he do that? See what I mean? And obviously this brings up a whole another set of things, but hopefully we'll look at that answer by the end of Job. Um, obviously we know that God is not evil. And that's another thing, that, that there's this tension in the book of Job between God is completely sovereign over everything and God is good. Right. So then it just keeps with this question of, so okay, so if God is sovereign and God is good, so he has the power to do something, and he is good. Why do the righteous suffer? And the whole book is a dialogue between Job and these and these people, which looks more uh, specifically at why the, why the righteous suffer. And it also contradicts some of the ancient views um, in the Near Eastern world uh, about why righteous people suffer. Mostly that it was some sin that they had committed, or something like that. Um, the the Near East tended to be very uh, super uh, what is it called not supernatural but um, what no um, uh, yes that one superstitious that's the one I was looking for uh, superstitious and that they kind of saw demons and, and spirits and stuff behind every rock and, and ah, yeah. you know everything was you know the gods were having this like competition about stuff and it always affected everything everything you did impacted the gods for instance right. uh, they had they would have like ceremonial sex and stuff that that would cause the gods to bless them or would cause the gods to have sex and therefore cause blessings on the land everything was superstitious so in that context job is a very important book for the Israelite people because and also for us too because it it, it really addresses what everybody in the ancient world believed and said, no, that's not true. So you you have to understand it. And oftentimes we don't read books like Job because maybe it's hard to understand or it's long or, you know, oh, it's just, it's just this guy and, and these other guys talking for forever and they just keep going on and on. But it's actually very important, um, very important work. So, okay. Um, it is also strongly against the clockmaker theory. Now, the clockmaker theory is basically that God set the world in motion and just kind of set, set back. Kind of like deism. Yeah, I was going to say, isn't that, I think that's what Benjamin Franklin believed. Yes, a lot of the uh, founding fathers believed that. Or deists or whatever. Yeah. Right. Um, so it, Job strongly contradicts that view. Um, so Job alone, you can see, establishes some very important themes about God that um, are really, they're taught throughout the rest of the Bible, you know, but it's just so strong in Job. Um, okay, natural events are miracles that God does regularly. Okay, miracles are miracles that God does irregularly. See, like for instance, if we are to push this to its fullest extent that God is sovereign at all times, that means he is always keeping the world in motion. He's always keeping things in their natural balance. balance. Exactly. Yeah. Which means that things like, you know, um, the development of a baby into an adult, God is always keeping everything in order. The universe and everything, it's not just... Um, what's it called? Uh, oh my gosh, I feel like an idiot. Uh, no, the thing that pulls us down. Force, oh gravity. Thank yeah. God, gravity. Oh my gosh, I feel like an idiot. Um, which means that things like gravity and stuff are held always by God. Everything is in its natural process by God doing it. So, the only, so keep in mind that that means that it is miraculous. Everything that God is doing is miraculous. The only thing is that it happens so regularly 
that we've deemed it as not miraculous. So then a miracle is anything that God does outside of that pattern. Like, for instance, God will typically allow someone to, you know, let's say, for instance, die from something like cancer, for instance. But God can intervene and heal them. See what I mean? That would be a miracle. But it's the reason why we die is because of God. God is the one who has limited our days. God is the one who, who draws our last breath. It, the Bible says that he has numbered our days. Is that thing okay? No, I was thinking that she'd just go pick up trees and pick up Oh, I don't know. Um, okay, so these are just some natural conclusions from what Job itself teaches, we'll, which, once again, we'll look at this more in depth in the future. Some things are the result of living in a fallen world, like, for instance, death, since I already mentioned it. Um, but some things are the result of others or self. Okay, Job's situation was not caused by himself, and it was not caused by someone else in the world. It was caused from this third category here some are the result of satan or demonic activity satan was directly um, attacking job and then the then the last result is some things are the result specifically of god for instance not all natural disasters are caused by god um well i shouldn't say caused by god um directly caused by god as a means of judgment that's that's i think better um for instance and i think it's first you're saying kings it references a giant earthquake and the prophets mention the earthquake too, but never once in any anywhere in the Bible is that earthquake said to be a punishment from God or anything. Right. However, then Israel is conquered by um, by uh, Syria, and it is very specifically said to be from God. Right. So you know you have to see things in kind of their perspective. Some things God specifically causes for a reason, and then some things God just kind of allows while still being sovereign. So that brings up another tension. Well, how can he just kind of take a back row and just allow something to happen? And this takes us to an area of God's sovereignty that we have a hard time understanding. See, in the book of Job, Satan asks basically to torture Job. Let's just leave it at that. And God says, okay. But you have to realize that God knew that Satan was going to say that. And he also knew what the outcome would be. And so it seems like Satan is antagonizing God into, into doing something stupid. But then you see through the whole thing that God actually knew what was going the whole time. And he had his own reasons. And he used what Satan thought he was doing it for this reason. But then God had his own thing that he was doing it for this other reason that Satan didn't even understand what was going on. So I mean, it's, it kind of blows our mind <laughs> with yeah. that. And uh, so you, there's kind of, once again, a tension between what we can know and what we can't know. God has the power to do but won't do. So I mean, you. You have all these tensions, and they all come to surface in the book of Job. Um, and that's one of the reasons why this is such, such a great book. Honestly, like you can read this book so many times and still just get so much. So uh, let's very quickly look at a few things. Uh, the story starts, uh, it says here, In the land of Uz, there lived a man whose name was Job. This man was blameless and upright. He feared God and shunned evil. So first off, it says he was blameless or, or righteous, some translation says. It doesn't say that he was perfect. It doesn't say that he didn't need salvation, okay? So that's important to realize. Nobody can ever achieve righteousness by just being a good person, okay? It's faith in God. And if you look at the rest of chapter 1, it clearly says he was putting his faith in God. He had seven sons and three daughters. You know, he did all this uh, stuff going down. One what? thing it says in the CSB yeah, go ahead. is that he was a man of complete integrity. Yes. That's a good That's yeah, a good translation. That's what I got. And if you look in, in what Paul says in uh, Philippians, which was the book we just looked at last time, um, he talked about being blameless. He's using it in the same sense. That you can be blameless, not perfect, but blameless in life. Above reproach is another way of saying that. Um, okay. So then hopping down to verse 5, it says, When a period of feasting had run its course, Job would make arrangements for them to be purified. I'm talking about his children. Early in the morning, he would sacrifice a burnt offering for each of them, thinking, Perhaps my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. This was Job's regular custom. So not only was he himself a righteous person, but also he interceded for others, which is a sign of spiritual maturity in, that the rest of the Bible talks about, is when you take the step of serving other people rather than serving yourself. So this is kind of kind of a, a, a big thing here. So it, it goes on, and it says in verse 6 that, that the angels are pre preventing, presenting themselves to God, and Satan comes comes in with them, and God just kind of starts this dialogue with him and says, you know, hey, what have you been up to, friend? <laughs> and Satan's like, oh, not much, just, you know, walking around. <laughs> and so then God's all like, well, have you seen Job? Uh there's, there's no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. 
Um, and so then uh, Satan basically says he's only he only serves you because you've given a bunch of blessings. So then verse 12, it says, The Lord said to Satan, Very well, then, everything he has is in your power, but on the man himself do not lay a finger. So God didn't act evilly. He allowed trials to come for his own reasons. Now keep in mind that the rest of the Bible clearly explains to us that God does bring times of testing and trials. Mm -hmm. This life is not about how happy we can be and how much you know blessings we can accumulate and how everything can go perfect for us. That's not the purpose of this life at all. And God is totally free to bring trials for whatever reason he wants to work character in us. See what I mean? It, just because Satan uh, was a key f factor in the beginning doesn't mean that God was acting evil. It, that, that doesn't mean that at all. It just simply means that God decided to use the opportunity to get glory for himself and to bless Job. Because it really was for Job's best interest that this happened. If you look at the end of the book, Job was able to encounter God in a way that he had never encountered him before. He would have gone the rest of his life missing out on that great blessing from God. Now, in the process, he had to lose a lot of people and things that were very close to him and very meant a lot, and he had to lose a little bit of health. But he gained something even better, a realization of who God is. And that's worth more than anything you could ever accumulate on, there, on this earth. So keeping things in perspective, it's not that bad when we encounter trials and temptations. I mean, there, there, there's worse things that could happen, is what I'm saying. Um, okay, so um, so Satan obviously doesn't see the whole picture, but here's the thing. God allows Satan to think that he's seeing the whole picture. Like, he doesn't correct Satan's misunderstanding of the situation. He totally just goes along with it. He's like, yeah, sure, whatever. And then at the end of the book, we don't have Satan's response to, to God, you know, the, the conclusion of the whole thing. We don't have Satan's response but he's not there in the conclusion of it. And something tells me he was sulking. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. You, you didn't curse God, dang it. <laughs> dang it. Right. So then in verses 13 through 19, um, uh, it, it goes through the different things that happened. Um, and I'm not going to read the whole thing. I'll just summarize it. Um, all of Job's children died. And he lost most of his servants, not not all of his servants, right. because a few of them lived to, to tell him what had happened. So that means he was left with approximately three servants, and he lost all of his animals. It doesn't say that the servants got away with any of the animals. It says that they attacked, took the animals, and that one servant got away, and then the next servant got away. So we, it looks like he's left with three servants and his wife and himself. Uh, so verse 22 it says, in all this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. Now, it doesn't say that it's wrong to get upset. It doesn't say that it's wrong to ask God why he allowed something to happen. Okay, so we're, we're kind of tiptoeing on the gray area here. Right. It says very specifically that he didn't um, accuse God of being evil or sinning. Those are two different charges, okay? The first being evil, that God is not entirely good. And when we go through trials, that's one of the things that enters our mind. Is God not as good as he says that he is? And then the second thing, accusing him of sinning, which would be accusing him of evil, because God cannot sin. It's, it's outside of his character. So if he was able to sin, he wouldn't actually be entirely good. So here we have a little bit of a, of, of a problem that, that, that God's allowing this thing that, that seems like a very evil situation, but yet God has his own purposes for it. And it says very clearly that, God, that Job never said that uh, God had sinned. So that takes us to chapter 2. Um, and, and the story kind of just continues through 2 from 1. There's really no, no distinction. All, the, only, the only real big important thing I want to say is that in Job 1, it happened that same day. If you look, it says, um, so when Job's uh, sons and daughters were feasting and drinking, um, the, the, the wind hit, or the, um, excuse me, uh, the oxen were plowing, the donkeys were grazing, the Sabaeans took them. Um, the fire of God burned up the house and the sheep. Uh, da, 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 da. The Chaldeans uh, raided the camels. And then in verse 18, um, a wind came and, and, and killed his sons and daughters. So with that being said, all those things happened in the, in the same day. Yeah, it was just like back to back. To right, back. the same day. So notice what Satan does, and I want you guys to pay attention to this because it'll happen all throughout your life. God, Satan likes to throw a bunch of stuff as at the exact same time to try and make us forget that God is good because if it all happens at the same time, we'll say, look at all these things that are going wrong rather than look at how good God is or look at what God has done right. good. For instance, Job still had his wife, which 
She hated him because his breath smelled bad. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, that's funny. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's funny. <laughs> yeah, it's just, it's my, he said it's, my breath smells offensive to my wife. So. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's good. I like that. Um, okay. Um, and so we really don't know how far in between the two events were, between chapter one and chapter two. Yeah. In chapter two, a similar routine goes to dialogue between Satan and God, except this time God allows Satan to take away his health without killing him. It, it does say this, though. It says, on another day. So we don't know how far between chapter one and chapter two are. We just know right. that it was a different day. All that happened in chapter one happened on the same day, but chapter two happened on a different day. Um. Here in, in verse 2, it brings up an important thing that Jesus also talks about. It says, And the Lord said to Satan, Where have you come from? And Satan answered the Lord, From roaming throughout the earth, going back and forth on it. Jesus clearly says, um, when he's talking to someone in the Gospels, I wish I remember too, that he says um, when a demon goes out of a man, he just roams around. Satan, the demons don't have a home. It, it's very important because in, 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 in popular culture, it's kind of believed that demons are just kind of hanging out in hell, persecuting humans. That's not the biblical no. image at all. No. Um, the, the the biblical image is that the demons are are, are, are homeless. They're they're in a basically in a, in a place where where they cannot encounter God in a comforting way. They cannot be saved. They cannot change their situation, um, and so they just kind of roam around. Now, we looked at the possibility of hauntings and that kind of stuff, and when we we're talking about the occult, so I don't really want to revisit that. But uh, moral of the story here, being demons don't have a home, they look to create problems. Which brings me to something that I wanted to mention. I was reading a book on church leadership, mm -hmm. and the author was a guy named Gene Wood, and he suggested that people who act like this, just looking to create problems in a church, are under demonic influence. Not demonic possession, yeah. demonic influence. Um, I thought it was kind of ridiculous when I, when I read that, but... I'm considering the possibility that that might might be real. When when someone goes into a church and just looks to see who they can destroy, they're acting very like the demons do. Yeah. And it's 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 hard it's hard to know for sure. It's hard to know for sure. I mean, when people are under the influence, they don't necessarily always act all you know crazy. And right. Right. It can, it can be. Uh, there can be other ways too. That right. And like, there's there. For instance, I read another book by Jim Simbolet, and there are these people who were trying to come and and help out with the church, and you know, it sounded like okay, but you know, they just kind of called him one day, and the next week they just came and they showed up, and so like, yeah, we're here now, and so he's like, okay, this is something, uh, and then behind his back. They started going and sowing discord behind the church, saying about how they would do so much, such a better job if they were the pastors and all this stuff and, and backbiting everything. So then he went to approach them about, about the next day, and for two hours, they did nothing but uh, but yell at him and accuse him of how, how, how bad he was doing a job just over and over and over again, uh, out, out yelling at him. And remember, he's a pastor of a church in New York. So uh, finally he just said, okay, you guys, you guys got to leave. We're, we're not doing this. This is, you know, this is my this is my church. God's called me here. You guys need to leave. And then they started changing their tone real quick. And oh, we're sorry. You know, we just want to work things out. And uh, that seems very demonic to me. Well, and yeah. Satan is the accuser of the brethren, right? Right. So. It's it seems to it seems to follow suit that when someone comes into a church with that kind of a destructive influence, I don't know how you want to say it. I don't know what your theology is behind it, but it it's. it's it does need to be noted that that's the exact same behavior as demons. So, whatever your view is on that. Um, okay, so then in, in one ten and two four. Okay, check this out. In one ten, it says, um, "Where is it? That's eleven. Have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything he has? You have blessed the work of his hands, so that his flocks and herds are spread throughout the land." But now stretch out your hand and strike everything he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. And then in verse two, in chapter two, verse four, it says, um, "Skin for skin," Satan replied. A man will give all he has for his own life. But now stretch out your hand and strike his flesh and bones, and he will surely curse you to your face. So it's kind of seen to be more of a progression. In, in chapter one, it's more of just physical blessings, but in chapter two, it escalates into personal health, which. Right are a big deal nowadays, but in the ancient world, it was a really big deal because they didn't have hospitals like we do now. Right. I mean, this could potentially be 
the end of Job. I mean, this is kind of a big deal. I mean, this is this is a time when pneumonia might mean you're down, you're down, you're dead. <laughs> so, right. I mean, this is kind of a big deal. Um, and I, I think that sometimes it's kind of lost in, in the modern culture. Uh, so then we hop down to verse 9, and he says, His wife said to him, Are you still maintaining your integrity? Curse God and die. So it's important to notice that Satan could have killed her, but Satan left her to yeah. live. Yeah. Which brings me to a very important point. Satan left her on purpose. Uh -huh. And I know there's been a lot of com comedians who talked about that. You know, like, ah, I know what I'm doing. Tim Hawkins of this hilarious joke. But seriously, though, don't let Satan use you to tear others down. Right. So, I, mean, I think that's a very important part. That, because how oftentimes do we as spouse, those of us who are, who are married, I know not everybody here is married, but those of us who are married, how oftentimes do we say things to our spouse that aren't necessarily true and just kind of tear them down more than we build them up? See, I mean, that's a that's a very, very important point. Um, I really want to get that across to the married people in the room because whew, being that kind of a person can come very, very quickly. And uh, so just be on your guard if you're married. And if you have been married, still yeah. be on your guard. <laughs> still be on your guard. So anyways. Um, <clears throat> Satan knew, knew her weaknesses. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah, and he knew that he could use her to tear him down. Right. Remember that down. Remember, remember that when you're going through hard times, who can say who is Satan using me to tear people down? Right. I, man, oh man, it's the stories I could tell. I'm gonna go ahead and stop there. Though, you guys can fill in the blanks. <laughs> Verse 10. He replied, "You are talking like a foolish woman. Shall we accept good from God and not trouble?" So God is worthy regardless, and that's one of the themes of Job is that even assuming that God is wicked, which it clearly affirms that God is not wicked. But assuming that God is wicked, he would still be worthy, which is a hard thing to deal with as people because we like to say that people are only worthy if they prove themselves. And Job leaves us with a little bit, at the, especially at the beginning of this dissatisfaction of, no, 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 how can we still bless God if he's doing so – if he's doing this? How, that's not fair. See what I mean? And it, and it surfaces things in us, especially if you're, in, you're one of those people who are in that circumstance where it's like, this is not a fair situation. God, why don't you just make it stop? Um, also, obedience to God is for all times. So in Job, we see really a struggle of who is God. Satan's trying, trying to prove that he's God and that he can make something happen that he wants. God is trying to prove that he's God and that he's sovereign over the whole thing. And so here is the problem with, with it, that Satan is bringing up with Job is, Job, who do you think God is? Is he really who he says he is? So who is God here? If God is – hold on. How do I want to say that? No, I want to skip that part. Sometimes I write things in notes, and I decide that I, when I'm actually teaching, that I don't want to say that part. So I'm just going to huh. skip past that. Uh, chap you get what I'm saying, though, and the part that's important. Mm -hmm. uh, when Job's three friends, Eliphaz the Temanite, Bildad the Shuhite, and, so and Zophar the Namathite, heard about all the troubles that had come upon him, they set out from their homes – and met together by agreement to go and sympathize with him and comfort him. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, right. Uh, hold on, guys. Hold on. When they saw him from a distance, they could hardly recognize him. They began to weep aloud, and they tore their robes and sprinkled dust in their, on their hands. They probably saw him and said, man, you are ugly. What? <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> then they sat Dude, on the ground. <laughs> I know you're not feeling good, but geez, have you heard about makeup? Come on, dude. <laughs> <Just my guess. laughs> then they sat and then they sat on the ground with him for seven days and seven nights. No one said a word to him because they saw how great his suffering was. Okay. So the only time they actually did what they set out to do was in the seven days of silence. It says that they went out to comfort him. The only time that they actually achieved that was in these seven days when they're quiet. Did you guys notice that? Yeah, when they started yes. opening their mouths, instantly the situation digressed. Right. And one thing that caused it is Job says something first. Right. Job says something, and we'll look at this next week. Job says something, and they, they ah, I don't agree theologically with what you're saying. Here's the thing you need to remember is usually when you are trying to help someone through a troubling time, it's not the time to have a bunch of words. It's usually the time to have big ears and little mouths. It's like in Ecclesiastes, there's a time to be silent. That's, that, right, blam, yes, exactly what I'm getting at. That is exactly what I'm getting at. 
sometimes we we think we have to comment on you know and and we we have to establish this theological textbook for every time somebody's in pain mm -hmm. when sometimes people say stupid things when they're in pain and you just kind of have to overlook it for the time being so you can help them through the pain and then later you can address the situation but anyways um so there was every reason Sorry, that's not supposed to everyone. Every reason uh, to believe Job was in error. In the ancient world, there was every reason to believe that Job was in error. Um, he lost his blessings, and then time passed, and he lost his health. That seems like the gods, or God, whoever, because back then they believed in multiple right. gods. So surely that means that he had sinned, or he had um, he had offended the gods. In fact, in the, in the ancient Near East, um, you could accidentally sin against a god and not even know it. In which case you go to... Um, uh, someone who would a, div a diviner, um, uh, which is a kind of inaccurate word, but eh, someone a cult. Uh, that's good enough. And they would, um, you know, sometimes be able to give you an answer, or otherwise you could just, I mean, just start random offering random sacrifices. But in Job, Job doesn't do that. It's a very important point. Um, so Abraham was called and blessed, though he didn't deserve it. Abraham's father was worshipped uh, pagan gods. Joshua says that. He did not come from a saved household. He was just another pagan. And Abraham and God decided to bless Abraham for no apparent reason. And Job, on the other hand, that's the exact opposite situation. He was serving God, and Job was cursed, though he didn't deserve it. Now, I want to look at that a little bit more in the coming weeks, so that's why I put it in um, these things. Yeah, those things. Um, so next week we'll look at chapters 3 through 14, um, and we'll also look a little bit more at the ancient belief on pain. Um, but, yeah. uh, but just a few more things before we close. Um, some people might say, well, this story isn't fair. Life really isn't fair. I mean, really, life just isn't fair. I mean, you, you got you got to come to come to grips with that. Crap happens all the time to everyone. I mean. Is right when you think that you've got it worse than somebody else, you find somebody else who has it worse than you. Right. I mean, honestly, we all go through different things. Death of loved ones, uh, sickness, all kinds of different things. Now, we don't really know why, but Proverbs does say that God made the rich and the poor. So God made you wherever you are, and the purpose of life is not to become rich. The purpose in life is much more important than that. So Job's, Job's struggles were used to benefit the many, including us. Remember that. Uh, and Job got more blessings in the future than he had in the past. And I already mentioned about how Job encountered God in a way that he never would have got, had God not, not brought trial. So remember that, yeah, the story isn't fair, but life isn't fair. <laughs> yeah. um, life is short, and heaven will give us the justice we're looking for. A lot of people nowadays, not I'm not, I'm not saying anything against social justice. I'm not even commenting on it. But some people are trying to make America perfect as though it's possible. But for every problem we solve, there will be another one. Because yeah. it's just as the, the, the peace that we're looking for is not going to be attainable on this earth. There will always be something that strips it away. Either, you know, um, America will fall to another nation and, you know, all the things that people work so hard will, will go away. Or, um, you know, a, an unrighteous ruler will come or something will happen. Something always happens. If you look throughout human history, something always happens. Uh -huh. So uh, keep that in mind. We're not. I mean, it's good. It's good to fight for justice, but at the same time, remember that ultimate justice and ultimate peace is not going to be found on this earth. Um, and then God is honored by what we do in this life. We see that in Job. Um, throughout this first part, it seems like God has not been honored, but God was honored, as He said to Satan. How? By Job honoring Him. See that? Even though it never even says that, we can deduce that from what God says to Satan. That's a very important point. The things that we do matter to God. Not because it makes him any more worthy or anything like that, but just because he cares. Um, so, okay. The riddle of the week. What can you catch but not throw? Do not say anything.